If you don't know how to calculate the finances of a property, the chances of you actually finding a positive cash flow property anywhere in the country is going to be extremely slim. The reason is you don't know a positive cash flow property when you see one. So it is important to understand exactly how to calculate positive cash flow property so that when it comes time to look at property, you can tell whether a property is going to be positive cash flowed or whether it's going to be negatively geared. Today's episode is brought to you by bluehorizonsproperty.com. Core and Helene help their clients invest in high growth, positive cash flow properties in the Surratt Basin, which is in Queensland. Go to bluehorizonsproperty.com today to find out more. In order to be able to calculate positive cash flow property, you need to take into account all of the income that that property is going to deliver you and also all of the expenses that that property is going to take away from you. So we'll go through this step by step so you can know the major income and the major expenses that you need to calculate and you need to take into account before you can estimate whether or not a property is going to be positive cash flow. So step number one is to work out the annual rental income. And the way to do this is to simply estimate the weekly rental income and times it by 52 because there's 52 weeks in a year. Now your property may lay vacant for some time, but we will deal with those vacancies in the expenses and work it out from there. I have found it so much easier to simply calculate the annual rental income if the property is 100% tenanted rather than taking vacancies into account at this point. So we'll deal with that later. If you want help on knowing how to find out what your property is going to rent for and you don't necessarily want to talk to a real estate agent, then head over to positivecashflowacademy.com and sign up today and I go through exactly how to find out how much a property rents for in module four. Step number two is to work out your total loan amount. Now, not how much you're going to have to pay, but actually how much your loan is going to be. Now, this is a step that not many people take, and it's a very important step to understand what your cash flow is going to be. So most people will simply look at either the full purchase price of the property or the purchase price minus their deposit and consider that as their loan amount. But here's what we need to do. First, you need to take the purchase price of your property. You then need to add stamp duty and you can use any of the stamp duty calculators that are out there on the internet. You need to add other expenses like setup fees or solicitors, all of that good stuff. You also need to add lender's mortgage insurance if you have a deposit under 20%. And then once you add up these things, so you've got the purchase price, the stamp duty, the lender's mortgage insurance, and the other expenses, now you minus the amount of money that you have available. Because what even if you have a 20% deposit, you're going to have to pay stamp duty, so chances are that 20% deposit after you pay stamp duty might only be 15 or might only be 10%. So it's important to calculate all of your expenses and then minus the amount of money you have to give you your total loan amount. Step number three is to work out your loan repayments. If you're going with an interest only loan, this is a pretty simple calculation to do. What you do is you take your full loan amount, which we just worked out, and you times it by the interest rate. So you times it by 5% or 0.05. And that will give you your annual figure for how much money you will need to pay in interest on that loan for that year. You can then divide by 52 and that will give you how much you will pay per week if you prefer to work it out in weekly increments. If you're going for principal and interest, which means you're paying your interest, but you're also paying money on top of that, so you can pay down your loan in 20 years or 25 years or 30 years, then this calculation is much more difficult to do. And it's not a calculation that I would explain to you in a video. The simplest thing to do is simply to find one of the loan calculators online, and you can go to onproperty.com.au forward slash calculators 
for a list of those and punch in your figures and it will spit out how much you need to pay each and every month or each and every year towards your loan. So that is the easiest way to do it with principal and interest. I'm not going to go into the mass of how you can work it out yourself because truthfully, you don't need to know and there's so many calculators out there that can do it. So that's going to be our major expense. Our mortgage is our major expense. So we've worked out our major income, which is our rent, and our major expense, which is our mortgage. Now, if your mortgage is more expensive than the rent, well, that's automatically going to be a negatively geared property. So we can do a little bit of analysis at this stage anyway. But now what we need to do is go into some more of the expenses to make sure that even if your rental income's greater than your loan amount, your interest repayments, that you're still going to be positive cash flow. So step number four is to calculate your property manager fees. Now these tend to range between six to eight percent. They do vary depending on the area you're in and depending on the rental manager that you go to. I do suggest that before you hire a rental manager that you interview a couple, find out what they're going to do for you, find out what they charge and choose the best rental manager for your property. But at this stage, I would calculate a higher percentage of approximately 8% because I believe that that's a more reasonable figure. And what we'll talk about later on, we'll talk about it in vacancy rates. But what happens is if your property becomes vacant, when the rental manager has to go out and find another tenant, has to advertise for that, they're actually going to charge you to do that marketing and advertising. And in a lot of cases, that calculates at about 110% of one week's rent. So even if you can find a rental manager who charges 6%, if you have one vacancy in the year, well, that's actually going to increase your costs for your rental manager because you're paying for those marketing fees. So I like to calculate at about 8%, but it's up to you exactly what you want to do. Step number five is to calculate your expected vacancy. So in the beginning, we looked at how much the rental income would be if the property was 100% tenanted. And I hope that your property is 100% tenanted and that you don't have to deal with getting new tenants each and every six months or every year or whatever it may be. But we do need to calculate an expected vacancy. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do this. You can calculate a percentage like 5%, which is a good percentage to calculate. You can calculate it based on one week vacancy if you wanted, which is 2%. Or you can go to a property magazine like Australian Property Investor and you can check out the back and look at the vacancy rates of your area and add that vacancy rate in. So if your area has a higher vacancy rate of 10%, then you might want to calculate 10% vacancy rate. If the area is extremely low, like 0.5%, well, maybe you can get away with calculating a smaller percentage on your vacancy. I would use a minimum of 2% vacancy, which is one week's vacancy, but I try to calculate based on a 5% vacancy rate for all the properties that I analyze. Tip number six is to calculate your insurance. So as a property investor, chances are you're going to want landlord's insurance and that's going to cover you for a wide variety of things as an investor. It's going to cover you for all your major damages like fire and flood and that sort of stuff, but it's also going to protect you against your tenants, whether they disappear and don't pay rent or if they damage the property or if they do malicious damage to the property. There's a whole bunch of things that landlord's insurance covers. And this cost tends to range from about $500 to $1,000 as a very rough estimate. You can get quotes online, so I would suggest going about doing that and trying to work out for the area that you're in, what is the insurance likely to be. Step number seven is to allow for repairs. Now, if you've got a brand new property that has just been built, then chances are in the first year or two, you're not going to have to do many repairs on that property. Maybe a little bit, but not much. But if you're investing in an older property, then you are going to have to pay to maintain that property and to keep it up to standard. As a property gets older, obviously more and more things age and begin to break, and then you're going to need to fund that to replace those items and to fix them. 
So I tend to allow again about 5% for maintenance, but depending on your property, if it's new, it may be less. If it's really old, it may need more. And when I say 5%, I mean 5% of the rental income. Today's episode is brought to you by bluehorizonsproperty.com. When it comes to investing in property, sometimes it can be so easy to get really overwhelmed. You need to research and find the growth areas and find the right properties within them and that can be very difficult. All in all, it can be a recipe for disaster if you're a new investor because one wrong move can cost you thousands of dollars. Core and Helene from Blue Horizons Property are successful property investors who have amassed a property portfolio which at one stage was over 70 properties. They successfully predicted the boom of many different areas throughout Queensland and they now specialize in high yield, high growth, positive cash flow properties in the Surratt Basin, which is in Queensland. They act as a property partner to their clients, giving them first access to new releases as well as helping them through the entire purchasing process. They personally invest in the area and many of their properties generate rental yields upwards of 10% with the added benefits of depreciation as well. Visit bluehorizonsproperty.com and view their featured properties today. Tip number eight is to calculate your strata. So if you are in a unit or a townhouse complex or even potentially a duplex, probably not, but if you're in a unit or a townhouse, chances are you're going to have to pay body corporate fees or strata fees. And these are fees that you pay to maintain the common areas. Now you will generally be able to easily find what the strata fees are and they're generally charged quarterly. So simply times it by four and that will give you a yearly amount. If you're purchasing a house, then you probably don't need to do this and you can skip this. Tip number nine is to calculate water rates. So this is changing. It used to be that the landlords would always pay for water. But this is not always the case anymore. In a lot of cases now, the tenants now have to pay for their own water usage. So if you're looking at a property where you can meter the water and you can charge the tenants, then you can leave this out. But if you're going to have to pay for the water, then you're going to need to take this into account. I would kind of consider at least $150 a quarter, so about $600 a year that I would take into account, maybe up to $800 or $1,000 as well, depending on how big your property is and the types of tenant that you're going to get. Obviously, smaller rental properties with less people living in them will probably use less water than a family of six people. Okay, tip number 10 is to add your land rates or land tax. And so this occurs when you have a certain amount of property or a certain amount of land in one state, you are often charged what's known as land rates or land tax. And this is an extra fee that you pay for owning a certain amount of land. Now this only needs to be taken into account if you are over that threshold and you can check the government websites to work out exactly what that threshold is for each state because I'm not 100% sure what it is. So a lot of new investors, you won't need to worry about this, but a lot of seasoned investors who own a lot of property might need to consider it. Tip number 11 is to add your council rates. So speak to the council or speak to the real estate agent to find out what the council rates are for the area that you're looking at purchasing in. Again, it's probably going to be charged on a quarterly basis or maybe charged on an annual basis and calculate that expense into all of your expenses. If you can't find out what it is, then I would kind of look at one to $2,000 per year, but it really varies significantly based on the area that you're in. Tip number 12 is to now go ahead and calculate your total cash flow before you take tax into account. So the way that we do this is to simply take what we did in step number one, which is our total income, assuming 100% uh, 100% occupancy, no vacancies, and then we take away all of the expenses we just talked about. Your mortgage, your manager fees, your vacancies, your insurance, your maintenance, your strata, all of these different things. We need to take away these amounts from our annual figure of what our rental income is. And if your rental income is greater than what all of your expenses are, then chances are you may have found a positive cash flow property, which is great news. Well done. You've gone through all these steps 
and you found a positive cash flow property. And obviously, if the expenses are more than what the rental income is, the chances are that it's going to be a negatively geared property. So this will give you your total cash flow before tax. And again, you can divide it by 52 if you want to get the weekly figure. If you want to take the next step and work out what the cash flow is going to look like when you take tax into account, you can do some calculations based on this. But I do advise that these are rough calculations and that these should not be considered taxation advice and you should always seek professional tax advice when doing your tax returns. So basically, in order to work out what tax you're going to be paying or getting a refund, you would take your total cash flow before tax and you would deduct what's known as depreciation. Now you can get the full details on claiming depreciation at onproperty.com.au forward slash 32 and I did a full article about that over there. But basically depreciation is you claiming as a loss the lowering in value of either the building or the fixtures and fittings inside the building. And so you can claim this against the income that you've earned in a financial year. And so basically you minus your total cash flow before tax, you minus depreciation against that to give you another figure. And then what you do is step number 14 is you add your tax percentage bracket. So if you're in the top tax bracket and you own over $180,000 per year, then you're going to add the full amount of tax that you would pay. If you're in a lower tax bracket, then obviously you're going to charge yourself less tax. And so if after you take away that depreciation, you're still making a profit on paper, then you're going to be paying tax based on your tax bracket. But if after you take that depreciation into account, you're actually losing money, well, the chances are you're going to get a tax refund. But again, you need to speak to your accountant. And so using your tax bracket, times whatever is your remaining figure of profit or loss by your percentage tax bracket. And this will give you a rough estimate of either the tax you have to pay or the tax refund that you're going to get. And so then you either add your tax refund or you remove your tax payment from your total cash flow before tax. And that will give you total cash flow after tax, which is step number 16 getting that total cash flow after tax. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things you need to take into account when you're calculating positive cash flow property. If you want an easier way to do this, then I have the advanced property calculator, which is a simple Excel spreadsheet that helps you go through this and analyze it for yourself. You simply punch in the figures and it spits out what your estimated cash flow is going to be. Now you can get access to this. It is a paid product, but it's really cheap. Head over to onproperty.com.au forward slash APC for advanced property calculator. So if that's something that you want to use as a tool to help you research and analyze property better, then go to onproperty.com.au forward slash APC. And if you want access to the full transcription or the full checklist of this episode, then head over to onproperty.com.au forward slash 127 for episode 127. So until tomorrow, remember, your long-term success is only achieved one day at a time.